Um, my name is Britta Zavada. I'm the Deputy Dean of Human Sciences at UNISA. Um, I'm tempted to engage Professor JP, but I realize that the document that he has seen does not reflect what happens at UNISA. We did not see the final document that you may have seen, um, and maybe I missed it, I'm not sure. Um, and a number of the initiatives that you have mentioned, I can tell you that we're doing it. But as, as Shireen said, we need to do it better. Let me leave it at that. And I think what, what we'll do is, is we'll respond maybe offline to you on some of the things that we do. Thank you. I'm Louis van Nieke from the College of Education, specifically curriculum studies. Uh, my concern is particularly about teacher education where we have recently in the newly established College of Education established a department, apart from science education and mathematics education, we also established a department for language, arts and culture education. And now we deal with students wanting to become teachers in the humanities, coming from the humanities departments. And my, what I want to address is the fact that in teaching, becoming a teacher in a particular field, you need to know, at least you be, be familiar with the epistemologies underlying, underlying your subject, your discipline. And I find I sometimes find these students coming from other disciplines underprepared. And that the curricula followed at, at the higher education institutions do not speak to the curricula that's offered at school, the CAPS, the Curriculum and Assessment Policy Statement. And it is almost as if these departments are not aware of what's happening in the schools. And I think that if you want to, 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 to have students, it starts at school really, that's where you start with your humanities training or education rather, um, then you need to see what's happening at school and these teachers very often are ill-prepared. Uh, you, you, you can actually become a teacher only with a second year level, that is uh, the current legislation. And, and, but we, have, we are restructuring our uh, qualifications now so that you can actually major in the school subject that you, you, you're going to teach. So I just want to, from an education point of view, that is what we're doing at the moment at UNISA. Another point I want to raise as an afterthought, as a postscript, a number of years ago, quite a few years ago, I think it must be 10, 15, uh, someone, uh, Professor Elizabeth Lickendorf, did a research study, she was still at the HSRC then, on the employability of BA graduates. I don't know what happened, whether it's ever been followed up or whether to, to, uh, if there's uh, any research uh, other than that in this field. But I think it seems quite worthwhile to look at the employability of BA graduates, people in the humanities, because she's come to very interesting conclusions that in times of economic uncertainty, what she's found is that, that students in the humanities are very, adapt very easy, uh, find it more easy to adapt and to, and to find an, a employment. Mm -hmm. I find also that in teacher education, and I've spoken just to, uh, to one of my colleagues just now, and that is that, that, that many of our uh, teachers, especially at UNISA, the university almost of the second opportunity, of the second chance, come to us and they've been through other avenues, now they want to become a teacher, and then they come and they want to do, they want to go into the humanities like, uh, like you've indicated, you want to do Mandarin and, and, or, 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 or Russian, and you want to become a teacher in that field, or you've, um, We've had, for instance, this year, two medical doctors f becoming disillusioned, disillusioned with, with what they're doing and they want to become teachers. So that creates us an opportunity to, 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 to recruit students from this pool to become humanities teachers. Uh, on your point about the employability of the BA, we did a study, and it's in the ASEF study, that suggested uh, that BA graduates, humanities graduates, get jobs very quickly in some cases faster than people in IT and these other fields. Uh, so, you know, I think the great myth is that if you've got a BA, you won't get a job. This is nonsense. Um, and also, and I think it's important to say this, is that it's your second part of this that the flexibility of people in the field is very good. You know, some of this country's most prominent people in business have uh, uh, humanities degrees. Bobby Godsell, Vincent Mapai, the list can go on and on and on. So in many ways, it's a false image that's been created that if you've got a humanities degree, you can't get a job anywhere and you'll struggle to get a job. I think that also needs to be taken on at 
at the chin, as it were. I'd like to address us, not as teachers, but as parents, especially um, those of you who are of my skin color. You know, uh, our children at home, we want them to speak English, we want them to speak Afrikaans. Our children in our churches, they, 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 they read the uh, Bible in English, they read the Bible in Afrikaans. And I believe if we, if we don't start at that level to conscientize our children as to what is really important, which really defines the, who they are, their own identity, and to an extent also their destiny, we are really going to deliver into these institutions um, children who do not know who they are, where they come from, and where they should be headed. Thank you. You know, a statement is bended everywhere, every time, that the African languages have crumbled. You said it also earlier. Every time I hear the statement, uh, for me it presupposes that there was a time when African languages flourished. Do you want to talk to that? You know, just to explain what you mean by crumbled with reference to the past. That's the one thing. The second thing that I want to, to talk about is the four-year degree. It's been about five, six years that this topic first emerged. And unfortunately, it is in a vacuum. It is When the topic is introduced, it, it undermines the context, for instance, of the NQF, National Qualifications Framework. Where do you place this four-year degree in that particular context? How will this four-year degree differ from a five-year degree or a six-year degree or a 10-year degree, for instance? What about funding in this regard of this four-year degree? You know, just to put some context so that when we talk about four-year degree, we know exactly what we're talking about. Otherwise, we will continue to talk about, like I say, it's been six years, for instance, that I since heard that we, th this topic was raised. And the last thing that I want to check with Shamil, I mean, you kept on referring to UNISA submissions, and I'm not quite sure what that was, what those submissions were, because uh, about three, four weeks ago, we were requested, we were given a week to respond to the two reports, a week. And in that week, we, we drafted some response. And, and the response to our submission at the time was acknowledged with thanks. So I'm not quite sure what the submissions you're talking about referred to, and I'll be very disappointed if it is the work that we did internally. Thanks. Well, let me deal with the African languages thing. I mean, it's clear from, if you look over a 10 or 15 or 20 year, 30 year period, that the number of students taking African languages has gone down. I mean, it seems to me absolutely clear, those figures. Now, we can argue about how African languages was taught or for what purpose they were taught. The point is that their student numbers have gone down. The, hang on, I, I, I just want to make this point. And that, and we've just heard the, uh, the uh, colleague at the back say, this is a crucial area. I think the problem was, or one of the deep problems, was that the globalization debate became so pervasive that it began to say it's better to communicate in English than in any other language. And I think the problem was that young people bought into that. And as a result, the figures show in African languages. Now, the biggest, pro you know, the biggest issue was that the globalization debate at so many different levels has shown to be bankrupt. But I recognize you and you want to come back on this. Yeah, you see, that's the point I'm trying to make. That if we say student numbers enrollments at university level have dropped, then that's what we should say, if that's what we mean. But to say African languages have crashed, 
when there are millions of speakers of no, no, this I'm not level. saying that at all. I'm no, no, but, but that's, what, that's what you said. For instance, I wrote what you said verbatim. For instance, what we have done also as a university is to introduce the teaching of Isindebele. We did not have Isindebele at UNISA. So with the teaching of Isindebele, UNISA teaches all the official African languages of this country. We need to acknowledge that, because if we don't, then we believe what people like you say, that African languages have crumbled, when in fact they have not. Well, I think that's a, a kind of difference in interpretation. I accept your point. Can I just make one point about the NQF that you raised? If there's anything we imported into this country that has got us into a huge problem, it's the NQF. This is a framework which was not built for this country. It came from Australia and New Zealand. It is a modular approach to education. And it is a completely debilitating thing. I think one of the biggest problems we've had, and I don't want this to be a back and forth between us, Madam Dean, but uh, I look forward to what your response is. It is a modular approach to education. It has not served us well. And as I prayed for the end of the apartheid, I pray for the end of the NQF. Uh, thank you. I am uh, Humphrey Mukhashwa from College of Human Sciences, Quality Assurance uh, Office. Um, I'm interested in the question of the massification of knowledge. I realize the earlier speaker, Prof. Uh, Hasim, highlighted that. And also, Prof. JP uh, highlighted that, but in terms of the practical ways, because uh, I'm thinking of practical steps of how to massify uh, higher knowledge, higher education knowledge. It's unavoidable. We need to, uh, because majority of the youth in the country, and SADC primarily, has got a lot of millions of uh, the youth and we really need to make higher knowledge accessible. And I think also some of the practical ways, because I'm glad also he highlighted also the issue of the work ethic that there's this tendency of uh, massive laziness in the country. And also that uh, we, we need to look at, I think in my view, our campuses, uh, university campuses, tends to close too early uh, that really they are not maximized in, in, according to my view, uh, and also the Saturdays are not well maximized. And when I look at the examples of Bolivia and Venezuela, where you find that uh, also, I think Prof. Uh, JP also highlighted that you can find students graduating that they've never been to campus, but also in Bolivia and I think Venezuela, they use the same model of, uh, they, ma they make use of the schools, you know, the infrastructures existing uh, to be of greater use to higher education uh, on weekends. So I think, those things, really, we need to not avoid them. And even the recent conferences, conference of ministers of higher education of SADC highlighted we really need to look into practical ways of massifying higher education. That is just my comment. Thank you. My interest, again, is still on the issue around language. And it will be, um, I, don't, I don't want to say injustice, but it will be wrong of us not to keep in mind the politics of, of mula, of money. Um, language in itself as an excluding or including uh, a phenomena or aspect in terms of, of where student numbers actually increase. So as, as, as Shamil says that um, why don't uh, we, we, we have a situation where it might be recommended, not first, but recommended that um, language should be an issue that if you want to do, you want to work in study in KwaZulu Natal, you must do Zulu. Um, history will tell you that people will migrate to where their interests will be served. So you can have that in South Africa where language is used as, as, as that, and at the end bites the country or by the institution, because again, history of South Africa will tell you that people will migrate to Australia. So how do the humanities get themselves to, 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 to be recognized without being a jeopardy of being uh, left out? Thank you, thank you very much, uh, Chair. 
My name is Kiali Bohamapunye. I'm with the Political Sciences Department at UNISA. Uh, just uh, as by way of uh, acknowledging what uh, 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 Prof. Shamil said, the, the issue about uh, the, that, that, that uh, quip that you made, that uh, uh, anyone who's talking about uh, uh, any discipline that, is called, that calls itself a science, uh, might not be a, necessarily be a science. I don't think it applies to our our department because <laughs> we, we bear that name. <laughs> we bear that name, political sciences. But having said that, uh, I really want to thank you for um, uh, underscoring the importance of engagements with uh, you know scholars in in Africa as well as the African diaspora. However, I thought in your um, emphasis, you were also going to highlight, especially coming from the Western Cape, because I used to work in, in the Western Cape as an academic for a few years, and this thing kept on coming out over and over again among, sadly, the academics, that uh, whenever they are going over to Mozambique, as you mentioned, or they are going to Tanzania, or they are going to Botswana, or even uh, uh, Botswana to uh, Swaziland across the, 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 the border, they normally use the phrase, I'm going to Africa. Now, you start wondering if a colleague at university with a PhD, with a master's and a senior degree starts saying that I'm going to Africa when I'm going to uh, you know, Dar es Salaam or, or uh, a, a Nigeria, you start thinking that there's a problem about possibly our orientation, our attitude. And I think uh, to support what you have said, my plea uh, to this uh, um, esteemed gathering is that we have to start thinking also about changing our attitudes. It's about orientation, essentially. Uh, the language that people are talking about, uh, the phrases that we use that I'm going to Africa, we also have to start correcting them to know that South Africa is very much part and parcel of Africa and there's no way you can say you are going to Africa when you are already in Africa. Yeah, no, look, I mean, it's, it's, these are just, uh, I've been, been working in the continent with various organizations and it's, it's, it's just a passion so, um, which I'm trying to share. I'm sorry if I took the um, thought pieces too seriously, um, but, you know, so I don't know the internal dynamics here, but I did um, happen to see these thought pieces, whether you call them thought pieces, initial drafts, slash submissions, whatever, whatever. It gave me a sense of some of the thinking. That's uh, what I refer to. So with due respect then, with due respect to the conditions under which they were prepared, it did give me a sense and that there are people who are um, wanting to align to um, the kind of revival of the humanities. There are people who are skeptical and critical and, and so on and so forth. So I, I, um, that's, that's what I can say in, in a sort of defense that you know, I did get to see some of these things. Um, I, with regard to the massification yeah, I can't really comment. I'm, I'm, I'll be trading way beyond my capacity. Um, uh, but, you know, th I do want to say something about engagement um, beyond... Um, we, we already very heavily overworked. Um, as um, Professor Hassan was talking, my uh, palms were becoming sweaty because I recalled those days up to 18 months ago when I was teaching, you know, masses of students um, and, and realized that I'm now sitting in an institute where I'm, I'm, I, I'm not teaching students. I do have graduate students and so on. But um, now for me to talk about community engagement is relatively easy than when I actually want my time off um, when I'm teaching already hundreds of kids. The, the fact is there must be... Uh, uh, they, 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 we have to have mechanisms for engaging. So at UCT, we do have, in the School of Education, we have a separate unit called the Schools Development Unit that actually engages, especially in the Kyalichat area. Um, so our institutions have to have, and academics can be drawn, or those in institutes can see that they also do things beyond that. But I, I can't get into a, a, a discussion around massification that's sort of a, of a popular education nature, um, but do want to stress um, continuing to have conversations um, with uh, people in communities, which I in fact find extremely uh, informative and, um, you know, I'm, I'm learning all the time. And that's my points about skills in the beginning we, and, and motor mechanics. 
You get it from talking to people um, on, the, on the street. Thanks.